Good morning to everyone, and a happy Sabbath is extended to each and every one of you. I am personally so happy to be here another Sabbath morning to discuss the adult lesson review. And with me this morning, Anik Adams, are the usual Sabbath um, panelists. We have Pastor Orville Joseph, Pastor Winston Joseph, and of course, Pastor Bradley, I mean, Elder Bradley Knowles. We will have uh, Pastor Sam with us shortly, but until then, we're going to continue and we are going to get into our interesting lesson. We're studying a new lesson where we have entered into a new quarter and we are studying the great controversy. And we are at lesson number one entitled The War Behind All Wars. Welcome, gentlemen, to Whispering Hope. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. You're welcome. Happy Sabbath, Azu. Happy Sabbath, Sister Nick. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Let's trust that today's study will be just dynamic and wonderful. <clears throat> Amen. Pastor Orville, how are you this morning? I'm, I'm great. Happy Sabbath. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, before we begin, I'm going to ask for you, Pastor Sams, to pray for us. And then I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Winston to just have a look at the topic. Uh, the topic for the week, the great controversy. And we know that this is a very important uh, theme in our um, SDA faith. We know that everything that surrounds us, um, we have to look at is impacted by the great controversy. So I want you to look at the theme and the sub-theme and to give us any further insights, Pastor Winston, um, into both of them so that we can situate our lesson for today. Pastor Sams and then Pastor yeah. Winston. Okay, let us pray. Almighty Father and our God, we are indeed thankful for the privilege of being able to come on this platform to discuss your word. We are thankful for the topic that we have been given this week, a topic that is dear to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that even as we share our, our insight, that your presence will be with us and bless our the viewers as well the heroes, that they too will be richly blessed, that they will be richly inspired and be equipped to face the battle ahead. Bless us now and grant, Lord, that all that we share, it will serve as a blessing to all. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, amen. Um, as we look at this heading, heading says, war, the war behind all war. And it, it, it gives that grand feel that we understand that this is a war like none other. I mean, come on, we are here in planet Earth and we have heard of wars here, wars there, but just not a war that engulfs everything. But here it is that when we talk about the Bible, we recognize that there is a war going on behind the scene. As a matter of fact, so I would have talked about if we only open the curtains, God will open a veil, a veil of eyes that we can see, that we can actually see that the enemy is after us. Like it or not, people have said, we are, what, what we recognize with the Bible is that when we talk about this war behind all wars, we recognize that behind, that's the, the unseen forces. That is God and Satan. And I'm saying to you, even with the, the fact that it's going on to, between these two big forces, we understand that, hey, look, that we are involved in this war. And we must make a decision whose side are we on. In every situation, we've got to make a, a decision. This war will determine where our world lies, where Earth lies. And we have to make sure that we continue to influence others who need to know who God is. Now, we understand that this war broke out in heaven. And if we understand truly that this war broke out in heaven, then we ought to know that heaven is a calm, peaceful place. And here it is, where God is situated and lies. But here, here it is that we realize that this war, this war broke out in a peaceful place. Now, there must be something to it. I'm sure we're going to go through it today. Then we can <laughs> see how is it that heaven a peaceful place could have a war. But it's interesting to note, we ought to make sure that we cock our ears, call our friends, and let them know that whispering hope is on. And we're talking about the war above all wars. 
Above all water. So so this is the real this is the real thing. This is not This is the real thing. This is the real thing. All right, no problem. Thank you so much for sharing, Pastor Winston. So Elder Brad, I would like for you at this point to read the memory text for the week and to just share with us um what you think it's trying to say to us or what is it we need to be aware of. Okay, I remember text is taken from Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. And reading from the New King James Version. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Um, so let me begin by saying to those who are not really very familiar with this particular passage, that this is not an earthly war. Neither, neither uh, was it like it, like it in, in any way, because it's not about guns and bombs and all these things. Because if you, if you reason it, in that kind of way, then it therefore means that um, Satan would be as powerful as God. I, I can't see how um, Satan would be able to develop a bomb as powerful as you know God would have been able to develop. However, however, just to simplify it, it's um, a war of words, right? So this is what is going on here. Two different arguments have been put up, and 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 the best one won, right? And so this is where the situation is. So it was um, good versus evil at that particular point in time. And so the Bible says that um, there was no place any longer found for them in heaven because what happened? What Satan was putting forward was no longer convincing to the rest of heaven. And so nobody accepted him. Nobody wanted him around. And so he was banished to earth just to simplify it because I'm sure we're going to expand on it as we get into the depth of the discussion. Amen. Amen. And that is so true. So we're looking at the great controversy. So we know that we, when you hear a controversy, I'm thinking of a problem, an argument, a quarrel. And this is um, described uh, this week as the great, it's a great one. And we know that there's a war, a war amongst, a war behind all wars. And so we want to go into the lesson now, looking at what was this war? What was the origin of the war, who were the key players, why did God allow it to happen? And so I'm going to ask my first question to Pastor Orville. Now, Pastor Winston highlighted a fact that war broke out in a perfect place such as heaven. I would like for you, Pastor Orville, to give an overview of this celestial war. What was its origin? What is it that happened? <laughs> Okay, so our, our, our memory text tells us that um, that Michael and his angel fought, and the dragon also, um, and his angels fought, um, and they prevailed not. Uh, the struggle, um, uh, Sister White seemed to suggest in the um, story of redemption, might have found its genesis in the whole idea that um, that that Lucifer was not included in the. Um, you know, the heavenly consultation um, as it relates to um, the creation of, of, of man and, and, and the earth. Uh, uh, um, he, being an archangel, um, felt that he should have been included. Um, I, I, I think he had the misconception, like some people do today, that because Jesus himself, with Michael, was an archangel as well, that they were on equal par. But not recognizing that 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 uh, Michael the, the archangel w w was actually God Himself, uh, you know, or God, part of the Triune God, uh, and as a result, um, he started his campaign in heaven to give others the impression that God was uh, was uh, 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 impartial. Was that impartial? Um, that 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 God had favorites. That 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 you know, um, you know, if God doesn't like them, that God would would, um, would certainly shut them out and so on. And, and and that becomes the struggle. The struggle was between 
the, the, the truth that was in God and the the error that was being proposed by 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 Lucifer himself, and as a result, um, heaven found that untenable, and and he was cast out. Uh, it, it is interesting that um, now having been cast out, that he was not satisfied with the judgment of heaven, but that he continued to wage his war, uh, and but that as we will discover will come to an end. Amen. Amen. And so, as you said, um, it was because of the, 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 the campaign and wow, I, I didn't even, I mean, you bring it to life. So these campaigns have been going on for centuries. We're, we're not seeing campaigns only here on earth when every five years, when we have elections in most countries. So there was a campaign that was going on. And so this was a type of uh, campaign where uh, the character of God was being slandered and God was being, you know, there was gossip about God because um, Satan, well, Lucifer wanted to um, win persons over to his side uh, to basically to state that God was unfair and he was unjust. So this is my next question. And I go to uh, Pastor Sam's. God is a perfect, infallible God, however. And if we operate from this premise, then how could have sin entered into heaven? What were the causes of Lucifer's rebellion? You know, uh, one of the questions that many ask, you know, and many of us ask, and it still baffles me, how is it possible that that, that war uh, could have bro broken out in a perfect place in heaven? And, and we can say, well, unfortunately, yes, war did broke out in heaven based on the Bible. But our lesson also explains to us that the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels, they fought against the dragon and he was cast out along with him, along with, along with the angels. Now, Lucifer was very talented and um, he, could, he was one that could have sung with many voices, as we are told. And when he, as it was, went campaigning among the angels to let, tell them, let them know that God is an unjust God, God gave Lucifer many chances, many opportunities, you know, so that he would repent, you know, from his rebellion. Uh, but Lucifer chose rebellion over repentance. Lucifer chose to dishonor his maker, forgetting that he himself was a created being. You know, and this conflict, this cosmic conflict started or originated in a perfect heaven. And from there, it spread out to the entire universe. And thus, the true happiness, the true joy, was destroyed. So then, um, what's the solution? You know, our lesson also tells us that only the only way that can bring this to an end is through the cross. I know I don't know if I'm going too fast, but um, only through the cross that this rebellion will come to an end. And I know that we will explore this as we go along. But it, the point is that we see God's merciful kindness in wanting to give Lucifer another chance to repent. And this is this speaks also of the of the mercy and the love of God, even towards humanity, that when we rebel, God gives us multiple chances so that we can repent. And this is the the the, the, the goodness of God. Amen. So even even in our our you know in our failures we can still see um, God's goodness and his mercy. And that was actually my next question. What were some of the aspects of God's character um, that were revealed when we reflect on his response to this conflict? Now, I'm going to still ask this question. I'm going to put a little twist to it, Elder Bradley. We see different aspects. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Sam. So you would have set us up um, by explaining to us um, how sin would have entered into heaven. What What is it that, um, what was the defect, Elder Bradley, Elder Bradley um, of Satan because what of Lucifer sorry was Lucifer made with a defect because I remember I if God is perfect and infallible he cannot fail he cannot make a mistake um, Lucifer was not a defected creature but how is it that he fell into this re uh, he had the spirit of rebellion I know um, this is a very difficult one to actually answer that it baffles the mind of every single individual. Mm -hmm. However, um, let me state what the Bible said. The Bible said that um, pride mm -hmm. entered into his heart. 
okay? And that made him become rebellious. Again, the question is asked, uh, how could something that happen in a perfect place? Well, where there is freedom of choice, there's always the potential for something to go wrong. And that becomes the core issue that is here, that is there, right? So God does not impose his will on any of his creatures, no matter what position they hold, right? God gives us the freedom to choose, right? And so, and so because of this now, he he had the, the 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 ability to do something that was wrong, even in a perfect environment. Okay, and um, one of the things I want us to understand as well that we have to see from the perspective of heaven, because the truth is that God would not be part of God. God, in His wisdom, knew that all these things would have happened. But what are the blessings that come out of this? Because sometimes we don't tend to think along that line. What are the blessings that come out of this? Now we're better able now appreciate the love of God, better able to understand what God's character is like, right? Even though, um, you know, sin and evil and so, and so on um, have, have developed in a perfect environment the lesson i want us to gain from this is that god has remained consistent throughout right he has not changed and he will never change there is nothing that can remove the love that god has for all of his creatures and throughout this controversy throughout all the back and forth god will continue to do his thing and his will will continue to be at the top of every single thing because he will do whatever it takes to make sure that we understand the whole controversy. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Elder Bradley. So there's a strong point that you made that God gives us freedom to choose. And once we have um, the power to choose, something can go wrong and something did go wrong. So even in our own Christian experiences, we know what God's standards are. We know what his expectations are of us. Um, but God does not force us. And we want to bring this um, truth to the forefront. God does not force us to choose him. He has done everything that he can do um, to make us understand who he is. But it's for us to accept. So we still have an active part to play in this decision process. We should not be passive. Okay. So it brings me to my next question, Pastor Winston. What do you believe was God's purpose now in planting the tree of knowledge of good and evil within the Garden of Eden? Because we look at the fact that God gives us a freedom to choose. But what was his purpose of putting the, the, the tree or planting that tree of knowledge of good and evil? Was it because he wanted to tempt Adam and Eve? Did he deliberately want to trip them up? Pastor Winston? The Bible, the Bible clearly tells us um, <laughs> that God tempts nobody. And, and 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 we must appreciate that. Uh, but however, when we look at when we look at the, 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 the tree in the Garden of Eden, we have to also understand that that was for the 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 the, the, the way that Adam and Eve will continue to be sustained in an atmosphere where they are they are oh, sorry, they should be living endless life. In other words, in other words. God is a God that has no end and no beginning. And when God um, has no end and no beginning, God created us um, finite, basically. And so we will also always have to come, go to the tree in order to extend life. Now, also, there was a choice element in the tree being there in the Garden of Eden. And here it is that Ella would have spoken about choice, but it has to be a choice of love. You see, the, even, in the, even in the study, the study tells us that love begets love. Now, what God is doing for us is that God is allowing us to make sure that, hey, look, because of his love, because we have all opportunity, because we have all choice, not God is holding back anything from us, but all choice that we now need to choose whether or not we are loving God 
because he first loved us or whatever. Now, when we, when we, when we look at it, I, I want to just jump into a, a different sphere here. Here it is that we find Adam and Eve. Eve was taken from the rib of Adam and she was put alongside man to continue to develop with man. Now, Eve would have taken a, a, a walk from Adam and she would have eaten the fruit. Adam could have decided, but Adam in the, in the normalcy of all what we consider love, he continued to run behind, behind Eve. And so here's it that sometimes we always continue to run behind the sins of this world. When we do have a choice, I want all of us to know that God has given us a choice. And that is love. That is how we can understand who God is. No matter the outcome, no matter the outfall, we have a choice to choose Jesus Christ, to choose God himself, our creator, because he could have lured it over us. And he could have said, you have no choice, you are a robot. But then God would cease to be a loving God. And it's love that begets love. Now, um, we need to understand. I know there's some persons who are married on the, uh, the, the stuff here. And if, if you love somebody, you don't want to force somebody to love you back. You want to make sure that you continue to give them love. And as, as you give them love, they will give you back love. And that is the power of love. And God is love. The Bible tells us that. So God will have planted the tree. God would have left the tree there. So Adam and Eve continually have a choice to choose him and the real wife chooses. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was placed there and God told them that, hey, look, this was there. It wasn't hidden from them. That's the beauty about God. God doesn't hide anything from us. And then we have to now make a decision day after day, hour after hour, Minute after minute, what's my choice? What's your choice? That's the beauty of the love of God. Amen. Amen. And so, as you said, Elder Pastor Winston, um, we really can give God thanks amidst all of this conflict because we can still see love as being the basis of everything because in spite of adam and eve sinning god didn't just leave them there um to wallow in sin you know he took it a step further he took it a step further and i'm going to move forward now um to another question i want to thank you so much for that submission um and point to some of the promises that god would have given to adam and eve even after they would have fallen as you said adam did not have to um you know follow in like suit as eve did but sometimes when you love when, when we as human beings in our human um finiteness when we say we love sometimes we get um we love till we fully you know but we have to make sure that um all in the lovey-dovey rubby dobby and i mean all of you are married men you know i'm still waiting to have this type of um experience in full but i'm sure when most of you here were quoting your wives that you, you know, you attempted to make some decisions that may not have been the best ones. But here we are. Um, so we can kind of, we can see, you know, to some extent, not that we agree with the decision made, but we can understand in our humanness or human nature what Adam would have experienced. But then his decision or his choice to, to sin and to disobey God had um, consequences um, that, you know, we're we are dealing with all up to today. So we know that disobedience is the doorway to sin, suffering, heartache, sickness, and death. When we don't do what we're supposed to do, we find ourselves in problems. I'm going to ask you now, Pastor Orville, what, what is sin and what are some of the effects of sin on us and others? Because I'm going to make it a point here that when we sin, it doesn't just affect us personally. It affects everyone. The implications are far-reaching. What is sin? For someone here on Whispering Hope who is still battling with what, what is sin? I, I know sometimes, um, I don't know where I heard it, but sometimes I would tell my daughter, delayed obedience is disobedience. So when I tell you to do something, I want it done now in good time. Not when you feel like, not when you finish 
watching something on your iPad, I want it to be done now, right? What is sin, Pastor Orville? And what are the effects of sin on us and on others? All right, so so typically, the typical Adventists would remember that um, when we talk about sin, that we say sin is the transgression of the law. Um, but but there's also another passage that says that um, he that um, knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So sin is is choosing not to do what is what is right or what is good, uh, uh, which it, it, in the case is a classical case that we're discussing with regards to the starting of the war that um, of all wars, if you want to put it that way. Um, but also sin is is also described as a lack of faith, um, a, a lack of belief that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do. OK, uh, and so those are those are the things that we, we, we need to bear in mind when we when we reflect on our relationship with God. Um, the Bible tells us in, in Romans um, chapter three and verse 23 that the wages of sin is debt. Um and also in um in in Romans if I'm Romans chapter five if I'm not mistaken in verse twelve, you know that um that as a result of sin death comes to all that, that comes to all man, um uh, you know so that's the result of sin. The result of sin is death is is separation from God. Um, ultimately um you know all of us will die as a result of sin. Um, the, the good news in terms of the promise of Jesus Christ is that the, as Romans 3 and verse 23 says, that the gift of God is eternal is eternal life. Uh, and um, God promises, uh, when you look through the Bible, you will see God's effort to, to, to restore, redeem, to, 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 to reestablish our relationship with him. I think it was earlier mentioned that, um, that when Lucifer himself um, found himself on the wrong side, that the council of heaven, um, you know, interceded with him um, for a change of course, uh, turning around, um, you know, um, so, so that, so that uh, sin in, in, in itself, and, and this is no license to go out and sin, sin in itself doesn't, doesn't draw us to a point of, uh, of no return. But, but what draws us to the point of no return is our refusal to accept the invitation that um that god offers to us and so um it, it says that god will do everything possible in order to save us from sin um if we allow him to amen what a god that we serve even though he gives us his law he tells us this is what i expect of you and i'm here with you to guide you along the way i'm telling you up front if you do this this is what is going to happen if you choose otherwise otherwise this is what your um the the result will be and we still go and choose otherwise god doesn't just leave us there and say well huh i told you so you know and come down with a belt god still um offers us a way out so i'm going to go forward now let us look at some of um the promises that God would have given to Adam and Eve, even after they, they would have fallen short past the sands, God gave Adam and Eve some promises after they had sinned. How do these promises, what are some of these promises that you can think of at this moment and how do they transcend time and place? Because even when we make it personal, our forefathers, um, spiritual forefathers, Adam and Eve, they sinned, but they, they weren't left by themselves to think that, okay, I'm going to be driven out of the Garden of Eden and we have, we have to fend for ourselves and God's presence will no longer be with us. Um, God made some promises to them. What about us now um, when we sin? God doesn't leave us either um, or isolate us and say, okay, well, Anik, you're on your own or Virgil, you're on your own or Winston, you're on your own, Bradley, you're on your own. No, he doesn't say that. How do these promises um, that God would have made to us, how do they transcend time and place so much so that we can claim them today? Give me a promise or two that you can, you know, bring to your, your memory at this time um, where we can, you know, believe that sin will not be the end of us or death will not be the end of us. And how can we claim them today as well? Well, we are certainly thankful to God that, when we sin, that he doesn't leave us on our own. God always makes a provision. And this speaks of the, the passionate love that God has for humanity. 
Uh, well, one of them was found, is found in Genesis chapter 15, as you may probably would have um, mentioned. Uh, Genesis chapter uh, 3, verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, um, well, of course, this, this text seemed to have signaled a declaration of war, which the devil determined to win. And so beginning from the descendants of Adam and humanity, you know, we, are, we have all paid a price for sin. But we are thankful that, that, that we serve a God who has promised that one day soon he will put an end to sin. Because again, Revelation tells us that he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. In other words, God had already made a provision so that humanity can experience salvation in Christ. So as much as the devil has determined to declare war on, 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 on God's people and against God, God, we are all involved in that battle to which none of us can win had it not been for the grace of God. So only through the grace of God that we can overcome this battle, that we can be victorious, that we can win this battle against the enemy. We can never win it on our own. And that is a promise that God has given to us, that he will be with us until the end of the age. And we are, we are thankful that God has made every provision. In other words, he has done everything possible so that we all can be saved. And of course, there are other promises made in, 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 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, somewhere there about, he says that, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but that we all should obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God has made, in spite of the sin that, 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 that the devil has brought upon all of us, God had made every provision whereby we all can be saved. In other words, it says that he, he has made an appointment with us, and that appointment is that we all should be saved. And there's nothing else that God could have done that he has not done towards our salvation. So therefore, if, if we are lost, it is no fault of God whatsoever but it will be because of our own doing, our own rebellion, because every provision has been made for our salvation in spite of the sin that, 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 that the devil has wrought upon humanity. Amen, amen. And, you know, even as we discuss this whole aspect of, you know, the great controversy, we are seeing the character of God being magnified this morning and, and, um, it is it is because of this great love that we see emanating from the acts and God's reaction to sin that you know we continue to be loyal to Him. You know, um, sometimes I, I have I've met persons in my experience who you know want to um, deny God's love, you know, uh, because of some of the sin and suffering that we see in the world. But we we cannot mix up. You know, um, God's character is unchanging and unfailing. And there's so many aspects of his character that have been revealed throughout time. And, you know, just as we discussed just the whole aspect of where sin would have begun, uh, we get a further glimpse into God's amazing love. And so I want us to look a little bit deeper, uh, Pastor Winston, at the system that was created in Eden um, when Adam and Eve had sinned. What service did God initiate in Eden that would point them to the solution of the sin problem? God um, gave Adam and Eve a choice. They chose to disobey God. Um, he had to allow them to leave Eden, but he made some promises to them, which Pastor Sam's just spoke of. However, they had to initiate some sort of um, system that pointed to, you know, the fight the, in the future, um, the, the, the end to the sin problem. Could you mention or refer to um to uh, get, tell, mention to us what was this system, and what did it really mean? Pastor right. Winston. So, yeah. So so as we look at it, um, even before they would have um uh, they, they're there, and um, sin is there, and God would have approached them, you know, and they began the blame game, um, and we do it even up to now today, that um somebody's blaming somebody. But here's it that God says. God says that. I know that you can't save yourself. And ultimately, as creator, I am who, the one who created you. And I now become responsible. So in becoming responsible, 
in God made the promise in Genesis 3.15 and also the one that um, Ella Virgil would have related to, both have come together. So here is it, that there was a system created that here it is, that because of your sin, something ought to be sacrificed. The Bible clearly tells us that the, way, the wages or the payment for sin is death. And so God would have created a sacrifice. No, they didn't kill the lamb then or whatever. God would have done it for them. And, and I'm showing each and every one of us that here it is that we are, that a lamb now had to be sacrificed because of sin. And every time, we, if you read the Old Testament, every time that they were sinned, and, and these guys used to have to make sure that they would have bring a lamb on a daily basis, or as a case may be, for them, for their family. And even if you're in a poor class, God didn't say, hey, look, well, because you're poor, I'm going to leave you out. God brought the thing to the point of even a dove, even a bird. You understand? And we need to understand, because this, this is in, an important factor. Sin should not exist in our realm. But here it is, it's brought there. We accepted what Satan was offering, and I say, I say we, because like you know, we are cut off of the cloth of Adam and Eve. And so we accepted this. And by accepting this, sin goes down to all men, not just some, but every single one of us are sinners. And because every single one of us are sinners, we've got to understand that the sacrifice that has been made constantly is to remind us that sin destroys. Sin brings death. So the leaves of the trees would start to fall. The blood of the lamb flowed. And we would have, Adam and Eve would have seen, hey, look, these things that they would have admired, these things that they would have been going around and taking care of because God would have given them the mandate to take care of these things. Now was suffering. And that's the same suffering that it promised that he would send Jesus Christ. Jesus, for the Lamb represented Jesus Christ that will come. You ask us the things that will happen in the future. And if we see it and we read the word, we'll understand that God would have prepared that system such a way. That system was a system that, that, that needed to change after a while because God would have promised his son, Jesus Christ, which would, would bring total fulfillment of that mm -hmm. system. You see, when Jesus Christ was here, and that's why we, um, around the world, they're looking right now at Easter. And as we look at Easter right now around the world, we recognize that we have the week. And it comes down to the Thursday. And it comes down to the Friday when Jesus himself was accused. The time it was at hand then. And all that was ready to take place took place. They accused him. They kicked him. They beat him. They did all sorts of things to him. And this is what the fulfillment that God was looking at when he created that system. But Jesus Christ would go through it and he will die for your sins. You see, the thing is, we need to understand that God loves us so much that he was willing to give of himself in order to purify you, giving you another chance, giving me another chance so that all of us could be saved. I love God. Um, I, uh, it's because he first loved me. I see him in everything. I see him there working it out for you, working it out for me, and gave of his life. It's not that they took his life. He self said it. He said, I give, I lay down my life for you. That shows me love. And it's critical for us to understand that even through the system, God told us love. And here it is. That he says that he, he, he died on Friday, rested in the tomb on Sabbath. And Sunday morning, he arose to show, hey, look, it is not just dead and final there. When I rise, it depicts the fact that my people, those who follow me and die, they too also will rise. That system brings out the fact that God gives us a promise that he loves us and he will give us everlasting life. I want to thank God for what he has done. Because he is truly a loving God.
Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, um, Pastor Winston. And so we see God again, truly for who he is, by, um, you know, allowing Jesus or having that plan of salvation intact in the event that we would have sinned. Now, Pastor Orville, I know you have been married. I'm probably here for the longest. I'm not, I don't, maybe you are Elder Bradley, but I don't know. I'm just assuming it's you. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure when you were dating your wife that you didn't just, you couldn't just go and say, Julia, I love you. Julia, I love you. You know, as as we know, the popular saying is, um, actions speak louder than words. Can you love someone and not be willing to sacrifice for them? Could you tell your, your, your girlfriend at the time or your fiance at the time that you love her, um, but you're not sacrificing anything? The question, the reason why I'm asking that, I want you to answer that question, eh? And then I'm going to ask you this next question. Um... I would um, like to ask you, what does Calvary's cross symbolize or what does it represent after you answer that question? Okay, so, so you made the big assumption that I have something to sacrifice. <laughs> Listen, um, in, in our relationships with one another, especially... Um, a spousal relationship and um you know the emerging relationship that leads us to that um boyfriend girlfriend um some would say um fiance as the case may be we become um we have a mindset that we are prepared to do anything that gets us into the position that we want to be in and so if if it means that we have to walk a mile when we would not normally do that <laughs> or if it means that we have to contend with with ravenous, um, ferocious dogs that uh, we, we will do that. Uh, if it means that we have to sacrifice and pay a little more for gas during the day, that we will do that. You know, um, because we want to demonstrate that we, we, we love, we care, we have a desire for, um, we go the extra mile to do things that we normally would not have done. I, I mean, things you wouldn't do for a sibling, you would want to do because you're pursuing a particular lady. You know, those are the kind of sacrifices that, you know, we are prepared to make. Uh, and so, it, 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 you know, within that context, it, you're, you're able to appreciate and understand the, the enormous um, sacrifice that God would want to make because he says that he loves us. Um, I think it, very humbling is the fact that he is prepared to, to die. Paul says that um, he is prepared, that, that Christ was prepared to even give up the concept of being God in order to save mankind. I, I, I mean, that is that is enormous. Uh, but, but Jesus himself says, scarcely for a good man would some people be prepared to die. So sometimes even for our, our spouses, our girlfriend, our boyfriend, our families, we are not prepared to make that ultimate sacrifice. But, but God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet sinning, he went ahead and died because he knew that through his death, we would be able to be offered the opportunity to be saved, to be redeemed, to be restored and to be reestablished, to, to have, to escape the, the well, to, to overcome the scourge of sin, which is death, and be able to live um, eternally. And, and so Christ was prepared to make that sacrifice. Um, and so that is something that, you know, is some, that we as, as individuals ought to be able to reflect on. Um, yes, we will go to this point and no more. I mean, even in our relationship, we would say, there are certain things that I'm not going to tell me. If you do so and so and so, I'll divorce you. I'll get rid of you. I'll, I'll move away because I will not tolerate that from you. But God says, hey, listen, no. As it comes to my relationship with you, I will do everything, no matter what you do, in order to restore you. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Joseph. And yes, Pastor Joseph, I know you had to sacrifice something because even if it's your time and your effort and your telephone bill and, you know, your gas bill, all of you gentlemen would have sacrificed something um, in your pursuits of your the ladies in your life, your, who are your wives now. And so we are happy and thankful to God for the cross because in the cross we see, um, you know, the ultimate demonstration of what love really is. Because I, I wouldn't do what Jesus would have done for anybody. All the love, I love you. I love you until the grave. Pastor Joseph, um, Winston, you know, sometimes you love somebody and you see them going on in the grave 
But I don't know which crazy person jumping in any grave. But I love you. I love I love you like how um what you say no. A cat loves milk. I am not jumping into the grave for a soul. So you can imagine God would have sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And so I really think that the cross um, is a powerful um, symbol and demonstration of Christ's love. And so we're thankful this morning for that because that gives us hope. It gives us hope in a real sense um, because even if God could have sent um, Jesus to die for Adam and Eve, who would have... Um, committed this grave sin that has such um wide or far-reaching impacts on the human race even up until today we are still battling you know the, the great controversy still rages we know that jesus is our hope and we can continue to trust in him so this is my next question um what should our response now be pastor sam's to the cross and this demonstration the immensity of Christ's demonstration on the cross. Yeah, our response to God's love based on what he did on Calvary. Now, it's the same as you mentioned earlier. Uh, you referred to Pastor Joseph as the longest, probably the longest being married. Um, I uh, well, in a few in a few days from now, I'll be celebrating my 40th anniversary. And Certainly, I must say that because of my love for my wife, and I, I do believe that had it not been for some sacrifices that I have done, you know, for, on her, for her, that our marriage would, may not have lasted. Uh, because we love, and, 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 and as we are told that God says that if you love me, keep my commandment. So therefore, my response to his dying on the cross, I have no other choice but to love him and to do whatever he tells me to do so that my salvation is secure. Now, I'm not doing it just because I want salvation, but because I've already received salvation from him through his sacrifice, through his death, that whatever I do, I do it out of gratitude. I do it out of love. I do it because of what he has done for me. And so it's, it, 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 it's, it's a natural response on my part to love him and do whatever he tells me to do. Amen, amen. And that is such an amazing um, thing there, Pastor Sam's. Pastor Sam's 40 years. Yes. I'm going to give you a secret. 40 years is all of my life and some. So um, I want to congratulate you and say congratulations and God's richest blessings in advance so when that wonderful day comes. Pastor Orville, I don't know how long you have been married, but I don't know if 40 years yet, 40 years yet, Pastor Orville, but I know I'm that... Just, I'm, just, I'm just getting out of 30. <laughs> okay. 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 All right, so then it's Pastor Sam, so I take that yeah. back. But at the end of the day, you know, the point that we want to make with Spring Hope Family is that um, God is able to keep us. God has already said to us, listen, Lucifer will deceive us. And we see this coming out in the lesson, but Christ is going to prevail. And so if we already know the ending of the story, God is so good. He doesn't leave it for chance or by chance. What's going to happen? We know that Christ has already prevailed and God has promised us, even as Pastor Sam would have said in Genesis 3.15, what is going to happen? Satan cannot prevail. The serpent's head is going to be crushed. Why is it still that we, a lot of us are living contrarily um, to, to, to what God wants us to live? Because God has already done everything that he can, like we said, to see us saved. And so I'm going to bring Elder Bradley now into the discussion um, as it relates to Christ's current role in heaven um, on our behalf as it relates to our salvation. Pastor Bradley, Elder Bradley, what role does Jesus play in heaven currently or right now as it relates to our salvation? Why should that bring us hope? Hmm. Okay. Let me um, go to the last part first. It should bring us hope because it therefore means that God is interested in us from the beginning to the end. He never leave us alone. Right? Um, so 
Christ play, plays a pivotal role because um, we, I want to view it in the context of how the ancient Jewish system used to function, right? Because the, the judge was also the lawyer, right? And so it therefore means if you take a case and the judge is the lawyer, you're in good stead, right? So, so it therefore means that we, we have somebody there in heaven who understands our plight. Someone who sits in a position of power to be able to help us with whatever struggles or challenges that we may have. Right? For the Bible says clearly that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's instructive to understand that he did not say an advocate who, but an advocate with. They are all working together to make sure that we are saved. This is essential to understand because sometimes we get off on certain tangents and say certain things which make the father look like a villain, right? And and what the father is in um, the father is interested in um you know thinking about the blood of Christ and the, 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 the those destructive things and so on. But it has to be instructive to us that that is what God is about. God is about love, and God wants to make sure that all of His people make it into the kingdom. And so there's always representation there. Hence the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace where you can find mercy and grace to help in the time of your need. Why can you go boldly? Because there's an adequate representation there. There's somebody there who is on your side and grace is available and grace is free. Grace is greater than all our sins. And sometimes I think what the challenge is for us is that it is too simple, right? Because how can you attain eternal life by just going to God and, you know, just pouring out yourself? Sometimes we think that maybe we have to do certain things and so on in order to obtain. No, it's not what you do. It's what Christ has done that allows you to gain salvation. So we need to put our trust, our faith, and our confidence in Christ, in God, understanding that that is what God is all about. It's saving us. That is what it is. And saving us comes out of a heart of love. Let me say this again. It is predicated on, on love. God has no pleasure in the destruction of any of his children. He wants us all to be saved in his kingdom eternally. Amen. Amen. Um. All, God wants all of us to be saved into his kingdom eternally. And as you rightfully said, um, Elder Bradley, um, what Jesus is doing in the, the heavenly sanctuary is key and gives should key to our salvation and should give us hope. Because many of us are chained um, to our past through self-condemnation, guilt, and shame. You know, we come to Jesus, um, even those of us who were raised in the church, um, who would have had the privilege of being raised in the church. Um, we you we face uh, temptations as well because Satan is not letting up, letting up, letting off, letting us up. You know, he's constantly tempting us, constantly coming um, against us, you know. And so the conflict is real. The battle is raging. Um, however, the point I wanted to um, to bring here is God has given um, us hope through his role currently as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. And he lets us know, um, you know, that his grace is what is sufficient and is going to take us through. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor um, Winston at this point to read for us Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. All right. And my question is, um, how can this verse be a source? How would you use this verse to encourage a new convert? Or let's say, I think, Pastor Winston, you were, I'm not sure if you still are part of our prison ministries. You know, you enter into the prisons and you, you know, you minister to the persons who are inmates there. How could we use the verse found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, um, to offer God's children peace, hope, and assurance of his love um, for them, um, even in spite of their shortcomings? 
you know, um, as we as we look at this, uh, we we need to understand that what comes before this is also important, which is Hebrews four fifteen says, "For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we were." Now that has been mentioned before, but what is what it tells us is that the Godhead, the one who is there, which is Jesus Christ. He has been on earth. He has gone through the things that we have gone through. And so he can identify with the trials that we have. And so here comes now Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Immediately after he says, let us therefore come boldly. Because I know that Jesus Christ come from Bakaya. Because I know that Jesus Christ have been in the dungeon, in, 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 the, in the gutters with me. Because I know that Jesus walked the dusty roads and, and, and people would have spat upon him and, and kicked him and done all sorts of things. Because I know that Jesus Christ sees he has been there and he understands my plight. Then here's what he says. He says, then I can come boldly. So even when I go to prison ministry, I haven't been there for a little while, Sister Annie, because we have changed over. And were, yes, but I'm going back as Pastor Alfred said, come. So I'm there. And, and, and I'm, I'm saying, I'm saying, he says, no, no matter what you've done, Winston, no matter where you've been, Winston, no matter what you've done, Annie, no matter where you've been, and it goes not just for us as seven Adventists, but for every single person in the world, no matter where you are. It says, come boldly. I don't want to use boldly. It says, you can be confident. You can come confidently to me. And that's why I like the fact that it says, we have the book. We see the beginning. We see the end of it all. And so we can come with confidence to God. It says, come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. The grace that we do not deserve. In other words, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to go and, and, and bow down 10 times and, 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 and walk upstairs and do all. We can come boldly because we know that God is saying that this grace is free. Amen. It's free. All we need to do is want it and we're going to work. We're going to make sure that we go to God for it. We don't have to work for it, but God is going to work it out in our lives. And it says that we may obtain mercy. If I truly believe that I'm a sinner and that I can be saved by grace, then I will in turn get mercy, which is that everlasting life where Jesus Christ would come a second time. And when he comes a second time, he's going to reward me, me who don't deserve it. Imagine that I'm getting two rewards. I don't deserve it, but God has given me grace and he's given me mercy. And here it is, he, does, he says, he says, to find grace to help me in my time of need. I don't know about anybody out there, but I want you to know full well. Here it is that God is putting before you. That grace that none of us deserve. No pastor deserve it. No, no, no pope. No, no, nobody deserve it. But I'm saying to you because we're all sinners. Sungula better than lungu. None better than none. And we all, we, God has given us that unmerited favor. Because he wants to save us. That's the love of Jesus Christ. That's the love of God. And I'm saying to each and every one of us. You can reach your hand out. And you can say God. Take my hand. Help me through it. Help me through. Help me through the, the lying that I'm accustomed to do. Help me through the stealing that I'm accustomed to do. Help me through the, 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 whatever problems that I'm in. Help me through it. And God is going to do it for us. So this verse. Tells us, therefore, that because God, because Jesus has lived through it, he represents me. But Matthew, he lived through it because he was sinless. He's a sinless God. So his, his sacrifice, his sacrifice is not the sacrifice of lambs or goats or whatever. But his sacrifice, as Jesus Christ, can save you or me even now. Amen. Amen. So 
we can have confidence in Christ because he is the one who gave his life for us. And Christ says, you know, just to compliment what you would have said, Pastor Winston, in Romans 8, 1, the Bible says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So as you said, no matter what we would have done or where we have been, we, we will fall, we will get back up. God wants us not to stay in that state where we have fallen because Adam and Eve fell. They were made perfect as well, but they fell, much less us, you know, who are so many years down um, in, 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 um, in our exist human existence. So God wants us to remember that we are not condemned and we're not to hold ourselves um, as prisoners, um, you know, in our own minds and how, how we operate. God wants us to hold on to his promises. He has died for us. And he wants to welcome us into heaven. As a matter of fact, the lesson says something that I want to read here. And I want Pastor um, Orville to add to this for me. Um, the lesson says that when the great sacrifice has been consummated, Christ ascended on high, refusing the adoration of angels until he had presented the request. I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. So Jesus said, I am not going to accept any worship until God a father, you accept these persons for whom I have died, you know. And then um, the lesson says that the, um, we call it, we see the inexpressible love and power coming forth from the father's throne. And God says, let all the angels of God worship him. And so it is after, um, you know, God would have, it's like, I went to war. I died for these persons. I am bringing them. I'm bringing the persons for whom I died to you to show you so that you can approve of them before I accept any worship. And so we can all give God praise and thanks for that and to look forward for that day when Jesus comes back to take us, his faithful children, home. We want to thank God for being our high priest. We want to thank him for being our creator, our redeemer, and our friend. Because, you know, when we go back through the ages, um, going through the biblical accounts of Genesis and with our forefathers, we know, we see, we have looked at today the origin of sin, the reason for sin, how that would have affected us then and even now. But then we see that love found a way. We see the power of love um, coming forth in this lesson. And it is on that that we can find hope, on that premise, um, that we can find hope because God is love. And as we wrap up this lesson, I'm going to ask um, each of you to give me what is your particular takeaway for this week's lesson entitled um the great controversy the war behind all wars pastor orville pastor sams elder bradley and then elder pastor winston what is your takeaway so, so i like the note that you um were concluding on um this morning in terms of christ uh, um desire um not even accept worship until he has um secured and sealed and be in the presence of those that he has made the sacrifice where this is constant yearning you know most of us see the cross as a as 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 a thing he went to for our redemption but again you know in in john in john um 14 1 to 3 that was his expression that um that you may be you know um I, i'm going to pray a place that where i am here you will be also it, it, there's a desire on his part for to spend eternity with us it is it, 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 he wants us to be in his presence so so that um so that he lost a third of heaven, but he is gaining a, 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 a host of individuals who are loyal, faithful, and and um, and dedicated to him, who will worship him throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. And, and, and I mean, I can't help but think how the angels were moved by the fact that ah, Satan accused him of being um, so selfish, arbitrary, and so on, but yet he's giving up his life to save individuals. But now he's saying to those very angels who want to worship him for what he has done, hey, don't wait, wait, hold on, because it is not over until they're in my presence, till we are um, fellowshipping together, till we are um, enjoying heaven together. And that is the beauty of the, 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 the conflict, that we can have this assurance that God has put everything in place, that um, it, it, even in spite of Satan's continued onslaught, his hope is that we all make it 
to the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing um, your final takeaway, Pastor Joseph. Um, what about you, Pastor Sams? Yeah, um, this lesson as such has been such a great inspiration. And it, it is very dear to my heart. And I know that it is dear to the Adventist heart as well. You know, that my takeaway is that although there are times when we feel that the battle is lost because we are all in a battle, but with Christ, we are always winners. You know, and it, it and this reminds me of the revelation where those who were redeemed how they sung this song. They sung a song that angels could not sing, where angels pulled their wings because they couldn't appreciate the depth of the tune. For the angels, they would have never experienced the joy that our salvation brings. And, and when someone asked the question, who are these people who, uh, that, are singing, that are singing that song? And John, John responded, and this was probably a rhetorical question because he says that, these are they which came out of great tribulation, who have washed their robes in the, uh, and, and, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And in the final analysis, Christ will be victorious, and that Satan would be put away. Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What about you, Pastor um, Elder Bradley? Okay, I want to use the words of a song, which I think, Best describe what I want to put forward. And the song says, Jesus, my Lord, we love me forever. From him, no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. There is hope in Jesus and we can trust in him completely. Praise the name of Jesus. Yes, we can trust in him. Pastor Winston, what about you? Thank you, Elder Knowles. Mm -hmm. Sister White, um, writes in Ministry of Healing, I think it's to page, um, page 249. And she says, he took humanity upon himself knows how to sympathize with suffering, with the suffering humanity. And that's a powerful word there I'm looking at. And if you're looking at Jesus Christ, who was able to take humanity, sympathize with us, that's my takeaway now. God knows there's hope in Jesus. He sympathizes with me because he knows me. He knows everything about me. I'm happy that we have hope in Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. We want to thank you this morning for studying with us on Whispering Hope. Thank you, Pastor Winston, for sharing your final thought. We have been looking at the topic, the great controversy. But today, quarter two, lesson one, we, we studied the war behind all wars. We looked at um, what really was the cause for the, the, the constant war that we are all in. Whether we, we believe it or not, we are all soldiers in, some, in the war. And we have um, now this morning to make a decision um, as to which army or which side we're going to be fighting on. Are you going to be on the Lord's side or are you going to be by default on the enemy's side? We have looked at the origin of sin. We have looked at the cause for sin. We have looked at how G God decided or chose to deal with the sin problem. We have seen um, what the power of love has done. And we have looked at what Christ is doing in the heavenly sanctuary, even up to now on our behalf. So we want to thank you. Pastor Orville, Pastor Winston, Elder Bradley Knows, and Pastor Sam for being again here with us on Whispering Hope as we discuss the lesson. And my takeaway um, is just simply this. The cross is the greatest argument for God's love towards us. And the song says, thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price that you have paid, bearing all my sin, our sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you, God, for grace. We want to give you praise. We want to thank you. We want to uplift your name. We want to magnify and extol your name this morning because it is only because of you and what you have done on the cross that we have promised the great promise and the great hope that we will be with you once we remain faithful. So I pray with Spring Hope family that you will be in that great number so that when we all are marching to Zion, all of us will be on that street marching our way. 
um, to heaven at last. Happy Sabbath, everyone. May God continue to bless you. Please join us every day of this week as we uh, zero in on the lesson on a whole. We only gave an overview today, but zero in um, on the lesson with us and continue to like, subscribe, and to share this video so that others can be blessed. God bless you.